and welcome everybody to the 947th monthly meeting of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. Our guest speaker tonight is Arnie Handen. He's gonna uh, talk about science with the Middleman uh, Atmob Observatory, which I think is gonna be really awesome. So let's press forward here. Let me see if I can make this go. Here's a nice shot of last month's lunar eclipse, courtesy of Julie Kaufman. Yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, that's um, what Julie actually Julie stole that from me. That's an image I took of the last eclipse. And uh, <laughs> um, I wanted to just acknowledge the fact that the flat earthers were wrong. The earth is not flat. It is flat, but it's supported by a bunch of elephants on the back of a turtle. So the Hindus were right, not the flat earth survivors. So we'll go to the next slide. I thought for the month, sometimes I think we're alone, sometimes I think we're not. In either case, the prospect is staggering. And that was a statement by Arthur C. Clarke, uh, contemplating the existence of alien life. And I know for those of us that go outside in the real sky to do our observing, uh, there are always moments where we just settle back and just look up at the sky and ponder what it's all about. And that, what, that statement he made is pretty interesting because there are times I think, what is out there? You know, who's looking, when I look at the Andromeda galaxy, I'm thinking who's looking back, even though they don't see us as we are now, if they had telescopes that powerful, but who is out there looking back? Another thought that I have is the future. Will there be descendants of mine? Am I looking at a star that descendants of mine will be colonizing or visiting sometime in the, the, the distant future perhaps? But the other thought that I find is kind of staggering is what if we literally were alone in the universe? That's kind of a, a scary thought almost. So it's something to think about. Next time you're outside looking up at the sky, just take a break away from the telescope and think about what's going on up there. Now we'll go to the next slide. I think these are our events for the month coming up. And Rich, I'll let you take over there on that. Oh, all right. All right. All right. I'm going to get you those headphones one of these days, Glenn. So no feedback oh, sorry on Sorry about that. Um, so on Friday, December 10th, why that's tomorrow night when it'll be all cloudy, Al Gol is at a minimum brightness. Now, I, a lot, I get a lot of this information out of my handbook of uh, the Royal Astronomical Society's Society of Canada's handbook. And you can run right down and look at Al Gol at when it's at minimum. And the reason I mentioned is because Glenn always talks about Al Gol. As you know, it's an eclipsing variable star um, that undergoes uh, about a, Glenn, help me out here, 1.3 magnitude drop in brightness for the, for the major yeah, eclipse. It's magnitude about 2.2 to 3.5. It's noticeable. You definitely uh, see the change over a period of time. And the entire eclipse from maximum brightness to minimum takes about five hours. I think it's eight in all, but the first hour and a half either side, hardly noticeable. The, the guts of that thing is about, you know, four. I've seen the guts of it in about four hours, four okay. or five. So if you, if, if you folks like to look at that sort of thing, even if just just take a casual look at it, we can include that every month. And here's another example. Next Monday at 5.59 p.m., Algo reaches the minimum brightness. And on that end of it, you'd be able to see it rise back up in its brightness. Of course, the December, uh, the Gemini meteor shower peaks on the evening of December 13th, Monday night, but the moon, unfortunately, is 78% illuminated. And unless Mario can figure out something to do with the moon <laughs> in the next four days, um, at least it sets at 2.39 in the morning. Gemini shower, is probably one of the better showers of the year, um, remnants of asteroid 3200 Phaethon. Um, the, the Geminids are known for uh, bright, graceful meteors. And so um, if, if you're an early riser, maybe you can get out there before sunrise and check out some of the meteors. On the 14th, Uranus is 1.5 degrees north of the moon. Might be a nice easy landmark for you to see that. The summer, uh, the winter solstice is on Tuesday, December 21st at 10.59 in the morning. And on Sunday, January 2nd, we reach new moon. And the reason I say that is because on January 3rd, the quadranted meteor shower is peaking. Now that's a strange meteor shower. It can be wonderful or most of the time it could be nothing because the quadranted, the quadranted meteors radiate out of a, a, an, an obsolete constellation, um, quadra, uh, quadrans muralis, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, and the peak is really short like maybe an hour or two. And so it rises up in the early morning skies, but if you're not, if, it, if that is not when the peak happens, we see almost nothing, but there it is uh, near the new moon. So if you happen to be out and about, check it out. On Tuesday the 4th, we reach perihelion at 91.4 million miles distance. I always remember it by saying that 
in January, we're close to the holidays um, because it seems to be counterintuitive that we're closest to the sun when we feel it cold outside. And yet in July, we're farthest away from the sun. But you all know all about that anyway. Um, on Wednesday, January 5th, Jupiter is 5.8 degrees north of the moon. Uh, two nights later, um, Mercury reaches greatest elongation east at 19.2 degrees away from the sun. However, uh, because of the, the orientation of the ecliptic, greatest altitude after sunset or at sunset will be on the, the 11th, but only 13 degrees above the, uh, the uh, south, the west southwestern horizon, um, which means it sets pretty quickly after sunset. So if you want to check out Mercury at sunset, you need a nice clear view to the horizon and you need um, to get out there uh, early, uh, right after sunset and hope to find it. I personally like to look at it in the daytime. Um, and what did I, I'm gonna go back one slide, hold on. Did I leave that out? Uh, the, the best event, the best event happens on the 8th of January when Venus reaches inferior conjunction. Oh. Um, 4.8 uh, 4 degrees away from the sun, north of the sun. And so you all know that I like to look at, um, I like to look at Venus as it passes through inferior conjunction. And it, at 4.8 degrees away from the sun, I mean, you're talking nine solar diameters away from the sun. And so the, the risk of blinding yourself um, because you would be using an unfiltered telescope is less. Um, you have to be very, very careful. But if you follow Venus through inferior conjunction, um, what you are treated to is a very large disk because it's close to us, but it's, it's almost, uh, it, it, the crescent is, is the thinnest, the little razor crescent you'll ever see. And it just looks so pretty, which is why I like to follow it through inferior conjunction. If you want more information about how I do it, just email me. Um, I sometimes will build a shield for my telescope, a long uh, uh, device to cast a shadow, but, I, but you can also use a, an aperture mask on your telescope. The idea is not to, it's to keep sunlight off the mirror. Not that it's gonna enter the telescope, but it produces a tremendous amount of glare. And so there are ways to shadow the mirror. Um, and so you can do it with either a shield or, uh, or uh, an aperture mask. So like I said, if you're interested, shoot me an email and I'd be more than happy to share what I do for that. And Glenn, you wanna do the observers challenge for the month? Okay, get back to it. Just one thing, uh, oh. getting back to what Rich was talking about. If you've been looking at the evening sky the last uh, week, a couple of weeks, we've had a nice lineup of planets, Venus, Saturn, and Jupiter. And uh, the past couple of nights, the moon, why a widening or wax, a waxing crescent moon has been going by those planets. So it's kind of a neat sight. Right, it, makes, uh, it, it allows you to sort of look at how the ecliptic action is right. in the sky, that great arc of the ecliptic, connecting exactly. the sun and those planets more or less. They're almost, almost exactly on the ecliptic. So you can see that line that arcs across the sky. And um, you, you can point out to people that, oh, that's what we call the ecliptic. So yeah, that's been quite, kind of nice to look at. And Venus is becoming easier to see also. Um, because just the changing orientation of the ecliptic. But here's our observers, observers challenge for this month, NGC 16, and the elliptical. Um, uh, yes, it's a, uh, I got it right here, a lenticular galaxy, which yeah. I guess is a hybrid between spirals and elliptical galaxies. And this one I found is a challenge. It's very faint. Uh, 12th magnitude to be exact, and not particularly large. It's uh, about one by two arc minutes in, in, in size. It's located, though, fairly easy to find as far as the location. It's right just a little bit south of Alpha Andromedia, the star called Alpha Rats, which on the chart to the right is uh, the this guy here, point right? one magnitude star. And uh, I, there are several ways you can star hop your way to it, but uh, when I did get to NGC 16, I'll be honest, I was using a, a 10 inch telescope. Skies were dark, there was a little bit of haze in the skies. It was kind of a mild evening, if I recall. Um, but all I could see was what looked like a faint star in the exact area. I had the chart and where that galaxy should be. All I could see was what looked like a star. So I went back to the AOV, AAVSO's chart plot and I plotted stars down to 14th magnitude, which is beyond what my 10 inch could pick up. And there was no star at that site. It was strictly NGC 16. So what I saw was essentially the nucleus. It's probably a very sterile-like nucleus. I wasn't able to make out any of the, the spiral arms or any of the arms out to the side rather. So for the visual observers, that might, the thing, that might be the thing to see is if you can see any of the outer parts of the galaxy other than the nucleus. 
And now we'll go to the next slide. Wait, let me just stay on this one for one second. Sure. Michael Covington um, has, is oftentimes quoted as having said that, um, that every galaxy deserves at least 15 minutes of your time uh, as a visual observer. And so if NGC 16 is faint, then okay, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't go out and try to look for it. And it'll, it'll train the visual observer to become better at being a visual observer. Um, give the galaxy a little bit of time. Play with your magnifications. You know, as you go higher in the magnification, uh, you, you tend to darken the background sky as best you can. Uh, that might be what it takes. Um, study the star field. And as soon as you start to see a hint of the galaxy, then you can start to pay attention. You know, use averted vision, jiggle the scope a little bit. Our eyes are really good at picking up faint things when they're moving a little bit in the eyepiece field. So those are some nice tricks to go to use on an object like this, because you're right, it's something like this, a little tiny galaxy is pretty faint. You know, there's, there's the next slide going with the picture up. Yeah, this is Mario's image. It's a mosaic. It's a couple of, of, of images he took with a 32-inch telescope. And you can see the shape of NGC 16. It is kind of a, a, an elongated object. Also in that view, though, are the first two NGC objects, NGC 1 and NGC 2. And those are galaxies. And as I recall, they're probably like 13th magnitude. They're very faint. But I noticed Roger Ivester, when he was uh, brought this uh, particular target up, he mentioned those would be challenges as well to see if you could pick those out. Uh, obviously, I didn't even try with a with a ten inch telescope, but I bet our twenty five inch it might be worth at the uh, clubhouse seeing if we can pick out those two galaxies. So there's something for Steve Clarity uh, to check in on with when we get a chance to go back out the twenty five inch. All right, next slide. I agree on that. Yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, comet Leonard, and I guess they're calling us the brightest comet of the year. Um, and I did look at, I saw it a couple of mornings ago with my uh, 10 by 50 binoculars. And uh, again, 50 years of observing, very scientific mind. I would describe what I saw. It's a, it's a cute little bugger. <laughs> little fuzzy little star, maybe a tiny little table. It was a cutie. It was, um, uh, I guess you'd say it was probably Halley's little brother. It was even smaller than that, or Neosat's little brother. Uh, go to, and that's and you, that's an image that Doug Paul sent. He saw that on November 30th. Next slide is by a new member, David Giordano. I don't know if uh, David is, is listening in, but welcome to the club. And uh, that's his image. And that was taken this past weekend. Now, David you know, notices, he, he mentioned that uh, this is the first comet he's ever seen. And I just want to say for some of us old timers in the club, our first comet was Halley's Comet. Not 86, 1910. That's our first comment for the old timers in the club. <laughs> but anyway, welcome aboard, David. And uh, we hope you enjoy many years with our club. Next <laughs> slide. These are some images of finder chats and these came from Sky and Telescope's website. And uh, it kind of passed just to, the, uh, to the, the left of Arcturus a few mornings ago. And I'm gonna be honest, I saw it myself on the, on the fourth was when I spotted it. And I checked it out again on the morning of the 7th, I believe it was, the 6th of the 7th. And I didn't know exactly, I knew roughly where it was. I wasn't able to find it. Now, one thing is I was out at six o'clock that particular morning. I think already I was losing anything I could see because the, they were starting to get some twilight glow. So I would say you want to go out, they mentioned 5.30 a.m. I think you want to go out as early around that time because by six o'clock, I think you start to get a little too much twilight glow. And of course it's going to get harder to see every every succeeding morning. It's going into serpents right now. We'll go to the next slide. I was going to say that usually the sky and telescope charts are uh, the dates are zero universal time. So we're here now. Uh, this yeah, is yeah. us right now. And so as yeah. that comet plunges towards the sun, it will become more difficult to see. That's but right. Over the so you may have, days. again, now we're talking 6.30. I know this is going to be really tough because again, it's six in the morning the other day. I, I had a hard time finding it. So it's going to be a tough sight. Now, the one thing, we cannot predict what comets are going to do. This comet, again, is a faint little bugger, uh, but we don't know what's going to happen after it passes the sun. Comets are very unpredictable. So we lose it right again, around the 13th, 14th, but we'll go to the next slide. And this is actually from the British magazine, Sky at Night. So they have a higher latitude. This is probably what you'd see at about latitude plus 50 north. 
Uh, so it'll be a little higher for us, but still you're gonna need a wide open southern southwest horizon. And I would guess this is probably a half hour to an hour after sunset, you wanna start looking there. You can see it goes between Venus and the southwest horizon on the 17th and 18th. It's worth a look-see. You know, it might, it might surprise us and really have a bright outburst. It might be just a faint, you know, kind of a disappointment like Kahootek was uh, many years ago. But it's well, always before, worth uh, checking things out, looking up and seeing what's going on. So before, uh, before we started the meeting, I'd mentioned Comet McNaught from, 19, right. from 2007. And, and this view here um, reminds me a lot of, you know, at least the position in the sky of that particular comet. So don't give up on this one just yet. Um, you know, you, it may put on, it, like you said, Glenn, it might, it might still put on a decent show. We hope so. I think that's it. So uh, again, keep looking up. It's always great to see you folks again, and we look forward to seeing you uh, next month. Clear right. skies. Thanks, Glenn. So this month's speaker is Dr. Arnie Hendon. Arnie received his doctorate from Indiana University and subsequently worked for Goddard Space Flight Center, Ohio State University, and the U.S. Naval Observatory as an instrumentation specialist. He was the director of the American Association of Variable Stars for the last decade of his career, retiring to New Hampshire, where he runs several automated telescopes. He is the author of Variable Stars and How to Observe Them and several hundred scientific articles. He has given lectures worldwide. And Arnie has worked very closely. Uh, and I, I'm I am just so grateful that uh, Arnie has worked so closely with the members of our Middleman Atmob Telescope Committee to help to bring the telescope and its camera system online. Tonight, uh, Arnie's gonna talk about science with the Middleman Atmob Observatory. And so, Arnie, you should be able to share your screen. Okay. Uh, I think you have to stop your screen sharing first. All right, there we go. See what you can do. There we go. And start. Awesome. I'm going to mute myself. Through. All right, it good. It is. It's coming in beautifully. All right. So I was asked to um, speak a little bit about what kind of science you can do with this uh, great new observatory that you have. And, you know, my part in this has been pretty small. Uh, all the heavy lifting has been done by the uh, uh, members of ATMOB, and so it's really uh, a great thing to see this coming together. Um, and the original presentation was going to be about 42 minutes and 30 seconds in length, and I can shorten that a little bit because of the uh, uh, preliminary information that's been already given uh, today. Um, and so you probably pretty much know the history of this uh, observatory. It was originally um, on the roof of David Middleman's uh, Dover, Massachusetts house. And after he passed away, then Michelle and the family donated the observatory to Atmob. Um, you guys have added the new camera filter, wheel filters and all that kind of good stuff and installed it at Westford uh, and designated it at as MAO. And this was the original location of the observatory on the Dover house uh, with most of the Sliskys there and David Middleman in the back. And this is your new location and the control room that you saw earlier with Chris. And this is the, the kind of remote access that you have with the uh, uh, system. And so most of the software uh, is been specifically designed for uh, remote observing. Uh, the ACP observatory control software in the upper left is the, the main control software. And this little window called scheduler down near the bottom is the all important one because that's the one that actually schedules all the observations. So the equipment is um, quite impressive for an amateur setup. Uh, not only do you have that nice uh, enclosure with the adjustable pier that Alan designed, uh, 
But the plane wave CDK-17 is actually a very good telescope. It's probably the best uh, uh, small telescope that you can buy today. And then in addition to that, uh, you've added the 0.66 focal reducer uh, to give you a little bit wider field of view. And the nice QHY 600 camera uh, with a bunch of filters. And so with the focal reducer, you end up with a focal ratio about f4.5 and about two meters of focal length. And then when you combine that with the camera, you obtain about eight tenths of an arc second per pixel, which is a good match for the typical scene that you'll have uh, out there. And about one degree by three quarters of a degree field of view, which is uh, quite large for uh, uh, a telescope of this size. The read noise is such that basically sky noise is going to limit you all the time. It's very seldom that you would, the read noise is going to interfere. And each of the pixels will have about 50,000 electrons uh, well depth, which means that you'll have a reasonable uh, dynamic range. And as you also saw earlier, uh, the mount is unguided, but it actually does track extremely well typical of a paramount, you can generally do five to 10 minute exposures without any trouble. And at that point, you really are sky noise limited. So uh, you can just stack as many of those as you want and you don't get any additional noise from the camera. This is a uh, plot that was done using what's called the CCD equation, which uh, takes into account all of the typical noise sources that you find in the CCD or CMOS environment, uh, along with sort of a typical sky. And this gives you a pretty good estimate of what kind of exposure you need for the uh, typical signal and noise levels that uh, you might do for uh, scientific photometry. The important curve here is the orange one, which is signal and noise of 100. That gives you sort of a hundredth of a magnitude uh, uncertainty in your measurements, which is a, a nice number to shoot for. And you can see that at 100 seconds, you can, gen you can go down to about 15 and a half or there rounds uh, magnitude. Now, this is highly dependent on a bunch of things, uh, primarily the uh, uh, brightness of the, of the sky. And so if the full moon is up there, well, you won't be able to go as deep if you have um, lights on the horizon, you may not be able to go as deep as well, but uh, it's a pretty good estimate. And the other one, so that means that at sort of a hundredth of a, or excuse me, a hundred second exposure, the faintest stars that you can measure accurately, and that's what signal noise of 10 gives you, sort of a 10% uh, deviation uh, would be expected, is about 18th magnitude, which is pretty darn faint. And if you use longer exposures or stack a bunch of them, well, then of course you can go much fainter than that. On the bright end, you can go down almost to sixth magnitude with a tenth of a second exposure. Um, what you run into is scintillation noise once you start getting to very short exposures. So, and the other issue that you have with uh, bright sources is that you generally want to have a comparison object in the field of view of your target. And at six magnitude, there just aren't that many stars in the sky. And so the chances are of finding a good comp star is pretty slim. So in general, you're gonna be working faint. And faint in this case means say 12th magnitude, 18th magnitude or there rounds. So if you want to use MAO, uh, there's, you basically contact one of the uh, managers and as was mentioned earlier, there is a proposal form that is nearly complete, will be on the website soon. And uh, Chris, I believe is the one who's doing most of the scheduling. But the thing is, is that uh, it's, you don't do hands-on operation very often. It's basically you put things into a queue and let the telescope go and do its thing all night. Images get put on a Google Drive so that you can download them in the morning. And this is the image that we saw earlier from Chris. Uh, the one thing I wanna mention here is the fact that you really do have good star images all the way across the field of view. 
And that is kind of important when you want to use a comp star that might be off to the upper right and your target object is sitting right in the middle. It's nice having good round star images everywhere. So what kinds of science projects can you do with this system? And I'm just gonna highlight a few. There are lots more. Um, these are kind of my favorite objects. And so uh, it's a highly biased view of the kind of science that you can do, but it may give you some ideas. As was mentioned earlier, Comet Leonard is up and uh, it's an okay comet, but I wouldn't call it a bright comet. When you think of bright comets, you think of Comet West or something like that, where you have a nice tail and you can see it uh, naked eye without any trouble. And those are pretty darn infrequent. I would say maybe once every five, 10 years, you'll see a, a comet that bright. But you can work with uh, uh, fainter ones with a telescope of this sort. And it's actually... Um, what you would primarily do because uh, you're not that much interested in the tail. The tail is just way too long for even a one degree field of view. That's the regime of the big wide, wide angle cameras. Um, so you're mostly thinking of the nuclear region rather than the tails. To me, the best amateur imaging being done today is uh, by Gerald Raymond. Um, he's a German amateur. Uh, who has a remote observatory in Namibia. And I'll show you a picture of one of his comet pictures in just a second. Um, and if you wanna do any comet research, uh, there are a couple comet forms that are good to go to, space.com and Cloudy Nights both have some. And this is the kind of image that uh, Garib uh, produces. You can see the nice ion tail from Comet Neowise along with the dust tail with a lot of structure. But for comet research, it's primarily concentrated for the nuclear region. And so most of the tail stuff is really nice to look at, but uh, doesn't give you a whole lot of scientific information in today's world. The nucleus itself on most of these comets is too small, sort of. 10 kilometers or there rounds in size for most of them. Um, but you can look at the jets coming off of the uh, nucleus of the comet. Those, uh, if you monitor them, will give you the rotation rate of the comet and also its activity level. The ion tail does have knots and disconnection events uh, that you can follow out for the, the one degree field of view. They will tell you a little bit about the solar magnetic field, though with the current advent of uh, the spacecraft that are up there. The solar field is pretty well understood, but it's a fun thing to do. And if you want to get into do, working with uh, sort of scientific end of comets, one thing to do is to look at Icarus and look at past issues for the researchers that are currently active. And of course, check with ALPO and uh, this nice book, Introduction to Comets, uh, is a good one to have if you really want to start learning something about them. So here are two pictures of the nuclear region from Hale-Bopp as an example. If you just look at a comet picture, you won't be able to see these kinds of detail because of the dynamic range that's involved. But with a CCD or CMOS sensor, there's a lot of detail that's in the image. You just have to get rid of that big contrast. And so what they commonly do is they scale the image based on uh, known uh, uh, image profile of a comet, uh, or else you can uh, uh, look at rings based circularly on the nucleus of the comet figure out the magnitude of the comet at each one of those points, fit a line and subtract it. And you can get down to see, uh, you know, the nucleus will still look like a star, but you get to see some of the structure from the, the jet region. And on the left is from our filter image and the right is from a cyanogen uh, filter. You can see a lot of detail and that gives you a lot of information about what's going on with the comet. All right. 
going out, you can do a lot of work with asteroids. Now you can't discover asteroids anymore. It used to be that you could, you could determine their orbit and you could then name the, the asteroid. But discovery is really rare these days because of these big surveys. The near-Earth near asteroid, near-Earth uh, object surveys um, pretty well catch everything. And so it's very hard to discover anything new but you can look at the ones that are already known and you can determine their orbits using the astrometry. You can also look at the rotation rates and uh, actually get shape information uh, from two different means. One is you can do time series photometry, you get a uh, rotation curve for the asteroid. And if you look at different aspect angles, you can actually back it out and get the shape of the asteroid from those observations. And the other way, of course, is from uh, stellar occultations. This requires kind of specialized equipment because you have to have a very accurate time base in order to do that. But uh, uh, this has been done for a large number of asteroids. Uh, I was actually involved in the first one, Pallas, back in the 1970s. Um, but it's uh, kind of fun to be able to do that. And there are various uh, predict uh, websites that will give you predictions of upcoming uh, occultations and the ones that are uh, going to happen for your particular location. And uh, this is uh, one of the nearest asteroids, Eros. And you can see that it uh, does rotate. And if you look at the light curve on the right-hand side, you can see that depending on the aspect of the asteroid, You'll either, it'll either be dim or it'll be bright. And so it has a light curve based on uh, its rotation and its shape. And if you do this over uh, a lot of different aspect angles, uh, you can actually deconvolve that and generate the shape. And this is another example of that. Uh, on the left is uh, a uh, particular orientation of uh, this asteroid and on a right, a different orientation. And you can see that the light curve will be different depending on how you observe the asteroid. So moving on, I'd like to talk, probably the rest of the uh, presentation will be on variable stars of one sort or another. And there've been about 2 million of these uh, variable stars cataloged so far, mostly from a bunch of surveys. Uh, the uh, Assassin, for example, and PanStars and all these other surveys that are out there, um, they are in many cases looking for near-Earth asteroids, but they also catch all the variable stars that are in their field of view. And every now and then they publish these lists and then they get incorporated into the AVSO's master catalog called VSX. One thing to note is that all stars will vary in brightness. You just have to wait long enough. Uh, as they contract onto the main sequence, they're changing brightness all the way. And after they've burned their hydrogen, then as they leave the main sequence, they're changing brightness again. Uh, those time scales we just don't see. But there are variables that are in what's called the instability strip, for example, and those are ones that, that vary over minutes to days from their internal structure. Um, and there are also ones that uh, are geometrically varying, like eclipsing variables, where you have two stars where one passes in front of the other. And the light curves that you get off of these uh, stars provide a lot of information, even though the star is not uh, accessible to you, the multi-filter observations will give you the temperature of the star, period changes can be seen, which give you a little bit about the evolution of the star. And if you're dealing with exoplanets, it turns out that it's important to know what the host star is doing. Uh, if it's a flare star, for example, well then the habitable zone may not be uh, habitable because the flares have uh, made it uh, an inhospitable place for life to, to exist. So studying the variability of stars is hits on a lot of different uh, 
um, areas of astronomy. And if you want to know more about uh, variable stars in general, the AVSO website is the place to go. Also on the AVSO website is what's called the CCD photometry guide, which gives you the uh, background for doing photometry. So once you get these images, to be able to analyze the images to extract the star's magnitude and then to uh, put it into a uh, submission file format, um, there are programs to do that. The AVSO has an online one that's available to the membership of the AVSO called VFOT, but there are also several other freeware programs like Less VFOT that uh, will give you the proper format. So one way of doing it is just to observe these stars and submit the data. You don't have to analyze them. You don't need to even know anything about the variability of the star itself. It's just the, pro the process of photometry. Uh, you can do this for a large number of stars that are on the AVSO website, what are called their legacy stars. Uh, they tell you a list of the stars that they would like you to, to observe, and you can go do that. About a dozen or two dozen times a year, the AVSO also runs campaigns. These are called, uh, these are announced on alert notices, and they tell you what star that they want you to study and how to study it. And in general, it's because some professional astronomer is observing with HST or something and needs ground-based photometry to uh, uh, support whatever they're doing with, the, with Hubble. You can also work with a professional astronomer sort of one-on-one -on, -one on his or her project. An example of this is the Center for Backyard Astrophysics where Joe Patterson from Columbia is uh, asking for observations of specific stars. And then if you really get interested in it, you can analyze the stars on your own, perhaps write a paper for the journal of the AVSO or uh, give a presentation. There's the AVSO, AVSO website uh, and uh, it's got a wealth of information you just have to drill down. If you're just starting in uh, variable star astronomy, if you notice there's a tab up at the very top called getting started, I would start there. This is a typical alert, alert notice uh, for, in this case, for monitoring an eclipse of a uh, star that has an eclipse about every two years. And there, there's a couple researchers who are very interested in that star. My feeling is that studying just run-of-the-mill variables like another eclipsing binary star, just really not very productive. And primarily this is because there are a lot of professional surveys today that are providing the kind of data that is necessary to uh, get a light, get a period and some information about what kind of a eclipsing variable it is, for example. And the additional information you get from you producing a light curve is not a, uh, a large amount of good science content from it. It's okay for education. It's okay for you learning about uh, what each of the types of variables are. But uh, I would probably, after you've done a few of these, I would concentrate on the ones that have a higher re uh, scientific return. And again, just like on asteroids, discovery of a new variable star is pretty darn rare these days because you're competing with big surveys, people with lots of money and lots of telescopes. So the parameter space for contributing uh, observations from MAO are in these categories. You can look at transients. So nova, supernovae, things like that. Professional surveys really don't cover these things very adequately. You can do multicolor photometry. A survey that covers the entire sky can generally only do it in one filter. And so if you need to uh, get more information about the star, uh, then you, do, you observe it in multiple filters, a B, V, R, I, for example. And it's kind of like low resolution spectroscopy. Long-term monitoring is another area that uh, surveys generally don't do very well because surveys come and go. They last for maybe five years or the lifetime of a, of a particular graduate student. 
Um, and a lot of these stars change over decades. Uh, an example of that is Epsilon Arrighi that has a 27 year period. That means that basically the lifetime of a professional astronomer, they get to see one of the eclipses. And so that's where continuing to observe is uh, something that amateurs do really well. And uh, it's a good example of how you can contribute. Very bright stars aren't being covered by the surveys but they're also pretty hard to do with something like uh, MAO because of the limited field of view. Crowded fields, on the other hand, you actually can do a pretty good job, much better than the poor resolution you get off of uh, the TESS exo, exo plant, solar planet uh, survey telescope in space, or something like the Everyscope, which tries to cover the entire sky at minute resolution, but with coarse resolution and uh, spatial resolution. And then anything that requires a rapid time series, for instance, the CV eclipse, cataclysmic variable eclipse, which may only last for 10 or 15 minutes, is something that can't be done with the surveys. And then again, any kind of a unique or topical variable where you just want to get as much data as possible, uh, that's something that, again, surveys can't do very well, but uh, MAO can do. Eclipsing binary stars, you can. Uh, certainly observe lots and lots and lots. There's probably several hundred thousand eclipsing binary stars that are in VSX. Uh, the upper panel just shows you the aspect of the two stars. Notice that the two stars are of different color and that impacts the uh, light curve that you see down below in that uh, the two uh, stars will have different brightness and different color. And so not only do you, does the secondary eclipse in this case not dip down as far, but if you look at it in different passbands, you will see that the uh, difference between the two eclipses will uh, be quite different, depending on whether you're looking at it with a red filter or, or a blue filter. The ones that are interesting to the scientists are those that are total eclipsing stars. That means that the two stars are in the plane of sky uh, with the observer so that one star is passing in front of the other. So you know the inclination angle. That's all important when it comes to modeling these stars. And the other one are stars that are decreasing in period, especially if they're decreasing rapidly, because that means then that the two stars are spiraling in and they may merge at some time. There have been a couple cases where the change of period is so rapid that they're almost certain that the two stars will merge within our lifetimes. And so it's something to keep an eye on. But the more of those that you can find, the better. This is a Cepheid variable, uh, just a uh, little animation of it. Uh, it's one of the pulsating stars. And so you can see that it changes in size, it changes in brightness, and it changes in color. And so all three of those things are things that are important to the star, uh, important to the scientist who's modeling the star. And uh, you can, again, get light curves of these stars, the ones that have multiple periods or are doing something different, like a uh, uh, changing period are the ones that are interesting to the scientists and uh, eclipsing uh, pulsating stars are even more interesting. There are only a couple of Cepheids that are known to eclipse. And I think there may be one R. Lyra that's known to eclipse and that's about it. So finding more of these uh, stars would be very uh, interesting to the professionals. And the only way you can do that really is to sit there and do light curves of them. Here's an example of a light curve of the prototype for the population two Cepheids, W Virginis. This was done with a 14 inch telescope. So pretty comparable in size to the 17 and done in four colors. So you have the, the blue, green, red, and uh, far red. And notice that, uh, there are two things in this light curve. It's a re this is a light curve where there are two uh, peaks 
per cycle. So this is two cycles of the variation. And the shape of the curve is very different, whether it's in the blue or it's in the far red. You can see the far red is much smoother than the blue variation. It's also lower amplitude. So that tells you that the star is blue. Uh, and then the other thing to note is in the red curve, if you look up near the peak of the curve, you can see that there's more scatter there than there is in the other two curves. This is probably indicative of H alpha emission in the star near maximum. And so that's something that you can determine from even this coarse resolution. And so if you know that the star has H alpha emission near maximum, but not at minimum, then that tells the professional astronomer that if, if they want to uh, look for the emission from the star, then they may want to look only at the peak of the light curve instead of uh, elsewhere in the light curve. And that may be important for an astronomer who only has five or six nights on the telescope as to tell him which stars to, to observe. This is another fun star. This is one from the Kepler Input Catalog, which is what KIC stands for. And this is the 8 millionth, and you can count it off, uh, entry in that catalog. This is a star that's also known as Tabby Star. It was discovered by some of the Planet Hunter folks uh, because Kepler, it was a uh, exoplanet search telescope. And notice that this star has a very weird light curve shape. There's nothing periodic about it at all. And the, cons the, the best theory of this is that we're looking um, at the star through a bunch of dust, sort of a ring of dust around the star. And clumps of that dust then go in front of the star and then rotate out. Um, and studying this over, many years then can tell you a lot about what is in that dust cloud. And it would be interesting to see if any of the features repeat, for example. Cataclysmic variables we've talked about uh, before. Uh, this is a kind of a picture of one, uh, uh, artist rendition, a big red star uh, circling a white dwarf in which matter is being pulled off of the red star into a accretion ring around the white dwarf. Um, and every now and then enough matter has been pulled off that it will then uh, uh, undergo fusion and you will get a brightening in the star. SO Cygni is probably one of the most famous examples of this. This is two years of uh, its variation in the V band and you can see that while it's sort of periodic, it uh, re repeats an outburst sort of every month or so. Uh, there are gaps, uh, there are variations in the height of each one of the uh, outbursts. And this is all reminiscent of uh, the fact that the flow of matter from the donor star onto the white dwarf and the white dwarf accretion disk is not uniform. And it's, it's sort of uniform in rate, but it all depends on um, how much matter is flowing and how bright the outburst is. So studying these stars, there's hundreds of active research projects dealing with various types of cataclysmic variables. Transient objects are one of the fun things to observe. Um, Flare stars, I would not uh, suggest observing just because they flare so infrequently that you can spend hundreds of hours monitoring a star before you see one of these 15 minute flares. There are some flare stars that are far more active than that and they're okay to, to, to study. But the typical flare star, I would just stay clear of unless you really are a glutton for punishment. Uh, Novi, there are a couple dozen Novi in our galaxy every year. Some of them are far south because they're in the galactic plane. And so uh, 
We don't get to see the center of the Milky Way galaxy very well up here at plus 40 plus uh, latitude, but you can still see several novae in any given year. Uh, supernova, these, there's tons of those to, to observe. And then a couple of these other interesting events. So novae, again, you get the same picture because it's the same kind of deal. You have uh, uh, a donor star and a white dwarf. And the difference is that more matter accretes primarily onto the surface of the white dwarf before it actually goes into outbursts. So the outbursts are less frequent. Most of the novae, you, we've only seen them go into outburst once. And uh, the outburst amplitude is much larger. They can be six or nine magnitudes in size instead of the more like uh, common two to four that you get off of a cataclysmic variable. They can also be very pretty objects. Here's Nova Hercules 2021, which went off earlier this year and is still visible. And many of these are in very pretty star fields. Uh, quite often the nova itself is uh, obscured and so it tends to be red. And so you can uh, not only get some very pretty deep sky images, but you can also do some science with them. An example of that is Nova Delphinus 2013. Uh, this is almost a decade of the light curve of that star. You can see that it got as bright as about fifth magnitude. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, faded pretty rapidly, but then you can see the individual years here, uh, second, third, fourth, et cetera, years of light. And you can see that the star is still visible at sort of 17th magnitude. So it hasn't faded away by any means. If you use multiple filters, you can see that the um, light curve shape is different depending on the filter that you're using. Most of this on outgoing years is due to the fact that uh, uh, novae, once they've sort of reached the end of their outburst, go into what's called a nebular phase. So they look like a big planetary nebula. And what you're getting is emission in some of the filter pass bands, but not in others. And so it's cooling down rapidly in some filters, but but in other filters, the emission lines are keeping it bright. But there is no single light curve shape for novae. Here are four different classes of, of novae, and you can see the difference in the, the shape of the light curve. Notice that these light curves only go out to like the first year or so after the explosion. And knowledge beyond that is not commonly found. Most people watch a nova when it's really bright and then they go away uh, and go on to something else. And there's a lot of things that are happening in uh, novae in later months and later years that are uh, worthwhile to continue to study and continue to monitor these stars. Supernovae are even prettier in many cases because they happen to be in galaxies. So if you like to take uh, deep images of pretty galaxies like M101, uh, then catching a nova and the galaxy at the same time is actually a lot of fun. The novae when they're bright are easy to see and easy to measure in brightness as they fade they get closer and closer to the background uh, uh, arms of the galaxy that they're in. And to get accurate measures of their brightness is, is much harder to do. Um, this is the light curve from that Nova that you saw there from 2011. And you can see again that in different filters, you get different light curve shapes. Again, astronomers can use that information to find out what kind of a nova it was and what it was doing at any particular stage. This one lasted for a long time. You can see that this is sort of 200 days worth of the light curve. And even at 200 days, it was still at a magnitude uh, 15. And that's easy to do with a telescope like uh, MAO. As a matter of fact, you can actually measure the brightness of stars in external galaxies. 
M31 is a, is a classic example of this, two million light years away, and yet you can measure the brightness of individual stars in that galaxy. This is the Cepheid variable V1. It's the first variable that Hubble found in M31. And the uh, it, uh, HST on the 100th anniversary of the discovery of this went back and uh, took some images of this particular variable uh, in M31. And you can see that it's actually fairly easy to see in Hubble's telescope images. It's a little harder to see with uh, an amateur telescope, but it's still not that difficult to, to do. In fact, here's the light curves that we did with, at the AVSO for M31 V1. And you can see that uh, it varies uh, from a brightness of about 18th magnitude down to about 19th. And this is typically done with a uh, sort of a 10 minute exposure with the MAO class telescope. And you can actually get a good light curve of this particular variable uh, in an external galaxy with your telescope. Here's another uh, star in M31. This is a recurrent nova. Uh, first seen in 2008. You can see two images here uh, on the left of when it's an outburst and on the right when it's not. It's actually a deeper image and so you can still see that it's not there. It has about a six magnitude increase in brightness and it occurs almost uh, every year on the dot. And so it just happened not too long ago and it's one that you actually can sit and measure. So it's uh, kind of a uh, um, fun thing that professionals do. They want to see who's the first one to see the outburst of M31 and 2008-12A every year. But you as an amateur have a chance of actually doing it first. The early time history of Novi and Supernovi is, is uh, almost non-existent. The, they go from being invisible to being, you know, 15th magnitude in the sky in only a matter of hours. And so the chances that a professional has time on the telescope and can swing around and get uh, measurements of that object are pretty slim. And so the, the more of these that are studied and the earlier in time that you catch them, the better. Finally, I wanna talk about exoplanet transits because this is the hot topic of today. It's a, exactly the same as an eclipsing binary uh, star, except that instead of having two stars, you have a host star and a dark object that's crossing in front of it, much like a Venus transit or a Mercury transit on the sun. The planets are small though, compared to the host star. Jupiter only produces about a hundredth of a magnitude variation if you were in the plane of our solar system, but uh, out at a, another star's distance. And often if you wanna look at something more Earth size, uh, there's no way you can do it from the ground unless you have a smaller star. And so that's what a lot of the studies are concentrating on, finding Earth sized planets around much smaller stars. TESS is the current spacecraft that's up, that's uh, looking for exoplanets. And it needs lots of help because in order to cover a large area of sky, it has extremely large pixels. And so in any given pixel, um, the uh, transiting exoplanet Here's an example of the kind of light curve that you would expect from a transiting planet, where on the entry into the uh, eclipse, you can see a definite slope and then a slope coming out caused by the limb darkening of the star. So it's a very uh, common sort of D-shaped uh, light curve that they're looking for. But the problem is that 
light curve shape can be mimicked by an eclipsing binary that happens to be in the same field of view of the, of the pixel. This is an example of a test pixel, basically. You can see the pixel size is kind of that blue circle um, or blue square in the upper left. And it turns out that the target star for TESS was this one called T1. And it looked like in a transiting exoplanet light curve, but it was actually being caused by T11, which is a star that was within the uh, uh, same pixel of TESS that was an eclipsing binary. So there's a lot of these false positives. And there's a large number of um, candidates that go on a website in which they want you to go and look at these uh, fields and see which star is doing the variation. Is it the target star that they expected? Or is it some larger amplitude, but say fainter star that's in the same field of view that uh, isn't a transiting exoplanet, but some other beast? There is an exoplanet section of the AVSO. Uh, you can go and look at the uh, um, uh, list of sections and get to this web page, and it tells you basically how to sign up for looking for exoplanets. Trouble with doing this with MAO is that you're talking about five hours of time that's used for any one of these transits. And so that's a large fraction of the time of the telescope on any given night. But uh, it's up to the MAO management team to decide whether or not to allot that amount of time. So in summary, I think that uh, MAO is a really high quality system. Uh, I would have given my IT for when I was in graduate school. And so that you have the option of using such a system, uh, you really ought to take advantage of it. There's plenty of scientific opportunities for doing that. There are organizational resources that tell you how to do it or give you guidance or just flat out tell you, I want this observation. And so you can, uh, anyone who wants to use the facility, I think can contribute valuable scientific uh, observations. So contact the MAO team for any further information on this. And uh, I'm perfectly willing to uh, answer any questions or give you any guidance uh, as to objects that I thought were interesting that may need some more data. So thank you very much. Thanks, Arnie. Thanks, Arnie. What a great presentation. Um, I have a question for you. Um, tell when I when you showed the picture of uh, V1 in the Andromeda Galaxy, it's just the arrow pointing towards a little section of the galaxy. Does the does the MAO facility have the capability to zero in on that particular spot in the sky? I mean, I guess I guess what I'm asking is, what's the accuracy, uh, the positioning accuracy for the telescope? I mean, I know when we do visual work, we put a low power eyepiece in first, and then we increase the magnification as we need it. But how does the um, how does the MAO zero in on something that teeny little piece of sky? Okay, let me get back to the slide. Or, or is it using Sorry. that entire, you know? So um, what our our experience has been that whatever if you have the RA in deck, and you give it the coordinates, it'll always be in the field of view the first time, and and. Every time I've tried, it's been very close to the center of the field. Mm -hmm. So it points yeah. extremely well. Yeah, and you have to remember the picture there, of, you know, the, the Hubble of the M31 in this picture is, you know, several degrees across. Well, it's, this picture is probably about two degrees across. Sure. And so the field of view of the of MAO <laughs> will be much smaller than that, but it, it's the positioning is actually pretty good. It'll be there somewhere. And with the uh, the way that it um, does a plate solve when it moves to any given field, it will actually put the star within, you know, an arc minute or so of the center without any trouble at all. And so, you know, there won't be a problem getting the star in the field of view. 
Yeah, our pointing accuracy is somewhere around 20 arc seconds. Um, yep. and, and, and we're aiming to get a little bit better once we get finished adjusting you know, all the other mechanical pieces. I guess as a visual observer, if I were, if I were gonna seek V1 in the Andromeda galaxy, I wouldn't even know what star to look at. Um, you know, I rely on my finder charts to star hop across the star fields to find something like the faint little galaxy NGC 16. Um, right. how, does the, how does the MAO ferret that star of interest out of all the others it must record? Well, the interesting thing is that what happens is that in the Fitz image that is created by the telescope is the, uh, pl the astrometric solution for that image. And so the software then that is used to display the image, for instance, VFO, will put the image up and it will put a circle around that particular star that you're interested in. And it'll, you know, it so it knows exactly in that image to within fractions of an arc second where the star is. Okay. So it's very different than visual observing. You don't have to star hop at all. That's pretty good. Because like I said, I wouldn't have a chart deep enough to show me where that star actually was. And so I'm glad that the software does that for us. Right. And it's That's really good. important when you start dealing with crowded fields. You know, M31 sure. is an example, but if you're doing a Nova that's uh, in the center of the Milky Way or something, you know, it can be really hard to, to star hop. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. modern uh, astrometry software is just amazing. That's awesome. What about quasars? I, quasars are variable. Yep. Quasars are another target. I didn't put them in here. Like I said, it's a very biased view of the, of the universe. Uh, I have looked at quasars, 3C273 and things like that. Uh, and they're, they're fun things to look at. Um, they're just like stars. To all intents and purposes, you just treat them like you do a variable star. And their, their time scales are usually typically short, yes? Short enough, yeah. What I mean, the they tend to, again, be more irregular. I mean, they they're don't really have a, you know, sort of a periodic pattern to them. Right. So, but um, because you're talking about something the size of, you know, the black hole type area, they don't vary quickly. Uh, you matter days to weeks is the kind of variation that you see. Oh, okay. So they're easy to do, easy to monitor, you sort of once a night or something like that and look at the variation. How about, I was thinking about trans-Neptunian objects. So KVOs and that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the interesting things that people are doing nowadays because of the uh, Gaia catalog that's uh, being released is that we have very, very active positions of all the stars. Um, we don't have that good of orbits for the KBOs, but we have some that are pretty well known. And so then you can generate these lists of when a KBO is going to go across a uh, faint background star. So it's very much like an asteroid occultation except you're going to do this with something that's much further away. And they move slower, but they're also um, uh, a lot, you know, you can't see the uh, KBO itself quite often because they're too faint, but you can see the host, the star that's in the background. And so you can actually do occultation measurements of, of their, their shape. Uh, you can, in some KBOs, they're bright enough that you could do photometry of them. But if they're that bright, they tend also to be pretty big and pretty round, uh, much like Ceres or Vesta. Mm -hmm. And so they don't vary very much. Um, so you don't have the same kind of shape variation that you do on these smaller asteroids. I've done a couple of KBO occultations. I think John Briggs was on one of our missions and uh, a couple of other folks in the club. Uh, very often the ones we were working with had such a large margin of error 
that uh, the margin of error was as big as the earth. So uh, uh, I don't, you didn't get lucky on that one, John, did you? And neither did I. No, but I, I got a negative observation that seemed to be important, but um, seeing the kangaroos was the best part of the, the enterprise <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and uh, and being able to use the Mexican National Observatory on a one meter telescope for a couple of nights was a lot of fun for me. Um, I think that next month, Rich, you can confirm this, that Sarah Seeger is going to be our speaker. Sarah is, that... is in, hold on. January? And uh... No, I think Sarah is in, I'll tell you in a second. I keep all this stuff pretty handy. Kelly I Beattie have. and I got to spend a week with Sarah and her husband Charles uh, last summer up at our main astronomy retreat. And uh, I'm really looking forward to, uh, I approached her at that time and asked her, uh, would you be willing to talk to the club? Because we've got this observatory and we can do some test follow-up stuff. And she was very excited. I think she's going to probably bring one of her grad students with us and they're going to offer some hands-on help. Nice. She's um, speaking in February. February. Okay, great. Speaking in February. I see that Mark has his hand up um, and uh, so do I. But uh, a quick question I hope that I have for Arnie. This is kind of a, a basic question about variable stars, Arnie, but I've always wanted to ask somebody like you. I remember 30 years ago, astronomers like Doug Hall were talking with a lot of excitement about star spots and, and detecting star spots. And this, of course, was before uh, uh, exoplanets were discovered uh, uh, the way they're going nowadays. Is there, a, is, is there a way to explain why, with all the attention uh, in days gone by to star spots, uh, exoplanet transits were not noticed uh, earlier than they were? Um, that's a good question. Um, star spots usually take a lot longer to rotate through. So the uh, variations that you see from star spots are a much slower modulation of the light curve. And so I think it's a matter of the fact that you couldn't sit there night after night looking at uh, these stars uh, with extended time series like you can with these spacecraft, because you basically have to look at it for uh, sort of three to five hours in length in order to see one of these uh, transits. And then you have to wait umpty ump days before the next transit occurs. And so the so there are probably some star, there are probably some measurements of uh, exoplanets that were hidden in some of these other observations, but we just didn't know about them. I hope that answers. Mark, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm, uh, thank you very much for a great talk. And it's nice to see another Indiana alumni. Um, so uh, what about double stars? I, I know you mentioned a little bit, you talked a little bit about double stars. I happened to image, uh, is it Alberio? I, I stumbled onto it the other night. I was using it as a, an aligning star and I noticed that it looked like a double and I did a lot of research on it and it turns out that it is not a double star, um, but, but it's more complicated than that. Um, is this the type of thing that people are doing research on? I mean, it's said that they hadn't even figured out, you know, they think that the main star, which is the red giant has actually has a star that's, it, that is a double star, but that the blue star that you see next to it is actually about 30 to 60 million light years away. Um, it just seemed like a very interesting system. It, do you think that this scope could be used to uh, observe orbits of stars around each other? Or is that something that takes too long compared to say, looking for exoplanets? 
Uh, it takes too long. Most of the stars that are far enough apart that you can visually separate them have orbits that are hundreds to thousands of years in, in length. And so it's, it's really hard. They have to be very close to us in order to be able to, to uh, have orbits that were short enough that they would be easily observable. Saying that, there are bunches of orbits of double stars that are in the literature where people observe um, either a part of the orbit or in the case of some of the stars, they've actually observed complete orbits and then it's come back around. Uh, and they just measure the position angle and separation of the two stars. And it can be done, but it's easier to be done with uh, surveys today than it is individual telescopes. The opportunity for producing something that has a scientific value is small, but educational value is large. So it's just something that uh, if you're interested in that, you can certainly look at it. One of the interesting stars in that respect is Myra, because it has a white dwarf companion that currently is only about half an arc second away from Myra itself. But depending on where you are in the orbit, it actually can be quite a bit further away from the, from the, the bright uh, long period variable. And if you look in the right kind of wavelength, for instance, in the U band, uh, where the Myra variable is much fainter because it's a very red star and the white dwarf is a blue star. And so the contrast is greatly uh, uh, enhanced. And then if you look at Myra when it's at its faintest part of its light curve, so that you get an even larger uh, uh, increase in the effective brightness of the companion, there may be a way in which you can actually look at the two stars and, and uh, see them both. Um, that would require, in the case of MAO, uh, what's called lucky imaging. So it's what is commonly done with the planetary telescopes. Uh, and uh, like Damien Peach does. And the uh, MAO is capable of doing that with their really nice CMOS camera, but it would require a specialized mode of operation, basically doing region of interest uh, reduction in the size so that you can get lots of images down and, and uh, pick out the best seeing images of that. But there are cases like that where imaging would be useful that is hard to do with surveys, but you have to really work at it. Thank you. Folks, have any other questions? Uh, can I ask a quick one? Sure. Okay, uh, Arnie, just you had that, uh, you talked about a recurrent nova in the Andromeda galaxy that had a period of about a year, you were saying. And I was wondering, <laughs> the, the ones I'm familiar with in that galaxy, it's decades sometimes between outbursts. Uh, is there any possibility this might actually be a, a Myra type variable? Because they'll they'll go a couple of magnitudes here and there, and uh, their their period is about a year. Is there any chance that might be a Myra type variable? No, because they oh. actually have spectra of it. Okay, okay. And so they know what kind of a star it is. In this case, it's very definitely you know a, a standard recurrent nova type, thing. and it's one of the the most regular recurrent nova that are known and also kind of the shortest recurrence rate. Right. So it's a very interesting star and that's why astronomers tend to watch it. Okay, thank you. Are there spectra aren't easy. The, sp the specter of the star require a sort of eight meter class telescope in order mm -hmm. to be able to get them. Well, I imagine that's because the light gets so spread out. I mean. You know. Yep. <clears throat> cool. Arnie, thank you very much for being here this evening. Your time and uh, ex expertise is much appreciated. Thank you very much. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the screen back for a second, close the meeting out, 
And then usually what we do is we hang around for a while and we just chat as if we were at, as if we were at the Center for Astrophysics and we were just all sort of standing around chatting. Let me just do this really fast and we'll finish out the meeting. Oh, you're one... doing that, Rich? I just wanted to let folks know the AAVSO is also having a book sale tomorrow morning. I thought, I thought it was canceled. I thought it was canceled. I did not see the cancel notice. I thought I saw an email saying it was canceled. Yes, it, I can confirm that the, uh, the book sale has been canceled in part because of concerns over COVID. Okay, thank you, John and Rich. Sure. Well, um, if you've been if you've been sticking around towards the end of the end of our meetings in the past few months, you you may be thinking that the next board meeting is going to be in January. But um, the everybody on the board is available on December sixteenth. So that's next Thursday night at eight <laughs> o'clock. And typical to um, uh, typical of our monthly meetings, I'll send out um, invitations. The membership is invited to come in and listen and watch. Um, board members, if you have any uh, agenda items, uh, be thinking about them. And you know, I'll send out an at, uh, please send me email, and um, we'll we'll do that next Thursday night. And the next monthly meeting is on January thirteenth, two thousand twenty-two. Um, our speaker will be Matthew East, and he's going to talk about. Uh, the next generation of uh, space telescope that he's working on, uh, the Louvois telescope. So uh, that should be pretty interesting. And by then, the James Webb Space Telescope might, maybe, at least be on its way to L2. And uh, we'll, we'll be able to compare and contrast, I suppose. So I want to thank everybody for being at the meeting this evening. And Arnie, again, thank you very much.